Hey guys, what's up? My name is Sky Webb and I'm here to talk about a true crime story that I cannot get off my mind. Welcome to this year's first Halloween episode of the fucking season. I am so excited. Before I start, I just need to put out a little disclaimer that I mean no harm to any of the victims or the victims' families and I wish everyone who was hurt within this story that most peace and solace either in rest or in recovery. But with that out of the way, happy True Crime Thursday and happy fucking Halloween. I am so excited for every True Crime Thursday of October. We're going to be doing a Halloween episode where I dress in some kind of Halloween costume that matches or goes with the Halloween true crime story that I am telling. So for extras and behind the scenes of how I got ready, what I did with my costume and my hair, which not my hair in this one, but in next week's video, oh, it is gonna be very interesting. Plus my makeup and all of that kind of fun stuff. You can head over to my Instagram or any of my socials. I will leave the information there and that's all linked in the description below. So today's case obviously is about a maid of some kind and I'm sure if you are familiar with true crime you can guess who I will be talking about today. Today's very spooky case is all about the Pappen sisters. The Pappen sisters refers to two sisters, Christine and Leah or Lee, I'm not entirely sure how she pronounced it, how it's meant to be pronounced but there was actually three sisters in total. The girl's older sister, her name was Amelia, and she had already been sent to an orphanage by the time the two girls were born. They were all born in France into a very unhappy home that was filled with abuse. The girl's parents were a little fucking shitty. Their mother was known to have very little sympathy for her daughters. She didn't really look after them very well. She didn't really care about them. And she pretty much just neglected them throughout their entire childhood. And their father, well, he wasn't much better because he was abusive, very abusive. And he was also an alcoholic, which definitely made the abuse worse. So obviously their father, is very abusive, but abuse comes in many different ways. So not only was he verbally abusive towards the girls and the mother, he was also physically abusive. But on top of that, he could be sexually abusive as well, especially towards Amelia, the older sister. In fact, when she went to the orphanage, it came out that she had been sexually abused by her father for a very long time, since a very, very young age. And when she was finally old enough to leave the orphanage, she actually left to go and pursue becoming a nun. And this meant she was leaving her two younger sisters all alone to fend off their pretty evil parents by themselves. And this is the fucked up thing. Even sadder than the sexual abuse, and like, that's pretty sad. That's as sad as it comes. That's pretty horrible fucking shit. On top of that, not only was Amelia being abused by her father, but her mother knew about it. And not only did she know about it, she actually was jealous because of it. She was jealous of her own daughter, Amelia, because Amelia got this attention and this sexual you know, encounters with her father, which she wanted nothing to do with, wanted no part of it, hated it, hated her life because of her father. And her mother was jealous of it because she wanted his attention. And she believed that Amelia actually asked for it and wanted it and she was stealing him from her. And this was why Amelia was sent to the orphanage to begin with because the mother was jealous of sexual abuse. What? The parents fought a lot in part because of these weird jealousy things that the mother had going on. So they would fight a lot in front of the girls and a lot of the time it would become physical. So there was a lot of physical fights in front of the children. And on top of that, the girls had pretty much every responsibility imaginable. They had to take care of everything in the home, they had to do all of the household chores, they had to do the cooking, the cleaning, just everything because their parents were extremely lazy people, they were extremely selfish people, and overall they were just shitty fucking people. And the parents actually ended up divorcing, ultimately due to the jealousy that the mother had over the eldest daughter, Amelia, and her sexual abuse from her father. If you divorced him because of the sexual abuse, I get it. We all get it. If you divorce him because you're jealous of the sexual abuse, 
Nobody fucking gets it. That doesn't make any fucking sense and you're a fucking crazy person. Also, don't mind this. It is doing my fucking head in. It's supposed to sit like this, like, like nice, but it's been in my wardrobe for literally an entire year. So you know what? I'm just going to tuck that shit away because that was doing my fucking head in. Anyway, moving on. So after this, the girls went on to live with their mother, but that was for a very short period of time before their mum dropped them off at a mental asylum and just never came back. Never saw her daughters again. So the girls now lived in a mental asylum, which I can't even begin to imagine the abandonment issues that they must have been going through at the time to have been abandoned by literally both parents and sent to a mental asylum of all fucking places to be sent. Craziness. And the girls didn't really cope very well in this mental asylum. They did really, really badly. And especially Leah, I'm just gonna call her Leah. I assume that's her name. Uh, she struggled and she was already a very quiet girl. She was already a very reserved girl. She didn't put herself out there very often. She had low self-esteem and just a, quite a lot of issues. And she, she was just very reserved. But once she was at this mental asylum, she declined so badly and so rapidly that she became a mute, essentially. She didn't speak to anybody. And even her sister, Christine, she knew, like she talked occasionally. She talked when she had to, but just like her sister, she did decline a little bit and she sort of made the decision not to speak to these people. But the sisters, they had a really, really close bond, which most sisters do, but especially in this situation where they've been through what they've been through and they're where they're at together, their bond was exceptionally close. And this allowed them to sort of communicate silently. They could communicate through body language and like facial expressions, which I, I like me and my best friend, we can kind of do that too. There's definitely been multiple situations we've been in where we will give each other a certain look and we know what we're talking about or know what's going on. Or, you know, you pick up on those sort of physical cues. You don't always have to be verbal. So the girls could communicate really, really well and express how they were feeling by just physical cues. People at the mental asylum though, they didn't understand this. The nurses didn't understand this. The patients didn't understand this. And people thought that these girls were actually telepathic. They thought that they could speak to each other through their minds because of how well they sort of did things. Like one sister would go to get up and the other sister would already be getting up at the same time. So it's like they told each other they were gonna leave. And people just found it so perplexing that they could do this, which is so interesting. I would have loved to see just how good they were at reading the cues to see like if there was a real, like some sort of validity to why everyone thought that they were telepathic or whether people just didn't know that that was a thing that people could do. I don't know, I just find that really interesting. And it actually worked to the girls' benefit because the girls didn't trust people, they didn't want anybody near them and because everyone thought that they were telepathic, they thought that they were some kind of evil or some kind of like witches or something was not right there. So people were actually afraid of the girls and completely steered clear of them, which was, as I said, absolutely worked to the girls' benefit so much because they, they didn't want people near them. They didn't want to talk to people or trust people or have any type of relationship or anything with anybody. Once they were released from the mental asylum, the girls went off to find work. Can you guess what they worked as? <laughs> so the sisters became maids and they worked as maids in different little jobs, doing little shitty kind of uh, positions until they actually landed a really great position as a live-in maid in a mansion. So this live-in maid job, it meant that they would live in a mansion and work for a retired couple, a retired rich couple uh, named Mr. and Mrs. Lanson. I don't know how to pronounce Mr. Lancelin's name, but he's not that important. So I'm just gonna move right past that instead of embarrassing myself. 
But Mrs. Lanson, her name was Leone, and they had two daughters together, but only one daughter lived with them, and her name was Guenevieve. So the sisters took this job and they began working, and they would work 14 hour days under Mrs. Lanson's, Leone's very watchful, very particular eye. She was very particular when it came to the cleaning and how everything was done. She was almost like a little bit OCD with the way things were done. She, like, she, it was very, very important to her. Very, very important to her that things were done properly. Properly. And the sisters would only get half a day off a week. So they were working very hard. They worked really, really hard and they continued working really hard for a number of years with still only half a day off per week. So it's, it's not much of a life when that's how much you're working for years. But they were really good at their job. They'd been doing it since they were younger. They cleaned for their parents. They they knew what they were doing and they were very good and they were very professional. But as the years went on, Leone got a lot more particular with the way she wanted things done and it seemed to bother her a lot more than it used to. Like, the way that the house looked, the way that the cleaning was done was much more important to her and much more sensitive than it was when the girls first started working for her. So at this point, she began to sort of flick or hit or like tap or throw things at the girls, like lightly throw things at the girls if the cleaning wasn't up to par, if it wasn't up to her standard. Really, really little tedious, ridiculous things she would take very, very seriously as time went on as she got older. So about two to three years later of this continuing, Leonie got worse. Again, this time she actually developed depression. So she would stay home a lot and she would be very down and she would have very big mood swings, but she would take a lot of these emotions out on the girls. So now instead of scolding them by, you know, verbally saying, hey, that's not right, or being like, hey, fix that, uh, her version of scolding them or reprimanding them it grew more violent and this meant that she would come up to them and bang their heads against the wall because she wasn't happy with what they were doing. So now here's where things get spooky. On the 2nd of February, 1933, the Lansons had a dinner party to attend, but Madame Lanslin and her daughter Guinevere, they both needed to go shopping in order to find a dress, something suitable to wear to the dinner party. After returning home from their shopping trip, the two girls found their mansion to be covered in darkness. All of the lights were turned off. And this made Madame Lanslin feel very uncomfortable. She felt very strange about entering and she was very cautious. But after a moment of consideration and discussion between herself and her daughter, Guinevere, they decided they really had no choice but to enter the mansion anyway. They had to attend this dinner party and they had no choice but to go inside and get prepared, get ready and get dressed. So with only small hesitation, Madame Lancelin and her daughter enter the mansion. The women were met by both housemaids who explained that the power shortage was caused by Leah plugging in a faulty iron. This news upset Madame Leone greatly because this meant not only would she have to get ready in the dark, but so would her daughter and inconvenience the both of them. It would make it very difficult for them to get ready and look appropriate and get their makeup on and get their dresses on in a house filled with darkness. Leonie started to yell at this point because she was very, very unpleased with the power shortage and she started to strike out at Leah. At this point, Christine, she lunged at a very, very unsuspecting Guinevere. And because of her lunging at Guinevere, this prompted Leah to lunge at Mrs. Leonie Lancelin. Christine went for Guinevere's eyes and then she instructed Leah to do the same to Mrs. Lancelin. In the middle of this fight and this brutal scuffle, Christine left the room and returned with two weapons, a hammer and a knife. At this point, Christine instructed her sister Leah to gouge out Leonie's eyeballs just like she was now doing to poor Guinevere. This attack against Mrs. Lancelin and her daughter Guinevere lasted for two hours. The maids gouged out both of the women's eyeballs, stabbed them, cut their legs, beat their heads with hammers, among multiple other various forms of violence. After the long two hour attack, both maids went upstairs and went to bed. 
Shortly afterwards, Mr. Lancelin arrived home ready to pick up his wife and daughter for the party that they were supposed to be attending together. When he arrived, he found the house the same way the women had, all in blackness. The difference was this time all the doors and windows were locked. So Mr. Lancelin assumed that his daughter and his wife had made their own way to the dinner party and he prepared to meet them. Once he arrived to the dinner party and realized that his family was in fact not in attendance, he again returned home, this time bringing a friend with him. Once they arrived at the mansion again, they found every single door and window that covered the entire house to be locked. There was no way that they could get into the mansion and so Mr. Lancelin drove down to the police station in order to ask for some assistance in getting into his own home. He then returned home with the police officer and his friend and after climbing over some walls and doing some different methods of getting over things, they got into the house. When they walked in, they were welcomed home by a very bloody, gruesome murder scene. A scene that was so bad, it was later described by a professional as a blood orgy. <coughs> they found Leonie's eyeballs wrapped inside her scarf that was still around her neck. They found Guinevere's one eyeball on the stairs and one eyeball underneath her body. Both women had been bludgeoned and stabbed so severely that they were beyond being recognized. In fact, when they walked in, they weren't even sure which one was the mother and which one was the daughter until closer inspection. They had gruesome injuries covering their entire bodies. Upon finding this, the policeman's initial thought process was that someone must have come in, killed the women, killed the maids and burglarized the home. Because of this, he had Mr. Lanson escort him to the maid's room to assure whether or not they were okay, whether or not they were alive or dead. Only when they got there, they found the light on. The only light in the entire house was the maid's room. So now the police officer and Mr. Lancelin and his friend begin knocking and calling out and yelling on the maid's door and upon getting no answer they decided to knock down the door. They break the lock and let themselves into the maid's room and what do they find? Christine and Leah laying in bed together naked. Sitting beside them, right beside their bed, was one of the murder weapons. The hammer that was covered in blood and still had hair stuck to it. Christine and Leah immediately confessed to the murders and they were consequently arrested and sent to trial, but awaiting the trial, they were actually separated. So they were sent to two different prisons. This did not work out for the girls. Christine had a severe mental breakdown due to the separation between her and her sister. The stress of being away from her sister and the trauma that this caused inside her mind caused her to have a very severe violent mental episode where she actually tried to rip out her own eyes. This obviously would be quite a disturbing thing for anyone to witness, someone trying to rip out their own eyeballs, and this resulted in her having to wear a straitjacket for the rest of her stay in this jail. It did, however, award her one small visit with her sister Leah, which she was very relieved to have gotten the privilege of. When Christine saw her sister Leah though, she ran straight towards her crying and hugging her and then she started to try and unbutton both of their shirts and she was heard saying to her sister, almost pleading and begging, please, please just say yes, please. This suggested to authorities at the time that the sisters were involved in some kind of incestuous relationship. But that theory was heavily rejected by a number of people and still to this day is rejected by a number of people who are invested in you know, true crime and this story in particular that say she wasn't in any way incestuous, but Leah was her safety net. Leah was her safety zone. Leah was her everything. And Leah was also very heavily influenced by Christine. So now that Christine didn't have somebody that they could sort of funnel their emotions and thoughts through. They were left individual. It just, it caused a breakdown. Remember those abandonment issues I mentioned earlier? Yeah. Christine was originally sentenced to death before the verdict was reconsidered and she was awarded, not really awarded, it's more of a bum bum. Uh, she was given life in prison instead and her sister Leah was actually given some lenience due to the court and authorities believing she was so heavily influenced 
by her sister Christine that she would have done almost anything that Christine would have asked. They felt like she had severe trauma and mental issues that had been, you know, she kind of attached herself to Christine and Christine somehow, you know, attached herself to Leah, but Christine took advantage of her in the way that she was the one making every decision and Leah was sort of a shadow of her sister and did what she was told by her sister. And so Christine was only sentenced to 10 years in prison rather than life. Lot to unpack there. So obviously the sisters were again separated. They were sent to different prisons and it didn't get any easier for Christine. This really, really, really impacted Christine. She had nobody to do what she wanted to do. She had nobody to control. She had nobody to manipulate. She just, I'm not a psychologist. I can't explain it. I'm also dumb, so there's that. I think it, it doesn't come out in words. Point is, she had a very, very hard time and this led to her having multiple, multiple mental episodes and breakdowns and just a really, really bad time in prison. It got to the point where she, she gave up. She completely gave up. She refused to eat. She refused to do anything that would look after herself. She completely refused to look after herself. She was so mentally distraught that all she cared about was Leah. She did not want to take care of herself. She didn't want to live anymore. And she literally wasted away in prison. She died because she starved herself for so long. As for Leah, she only served eight years in prison. Eight years, and let's not forget, she might have been manipulated, but she gouged out somebody's eyeballs while they were still alive. Let's not forget that. So she spent eight years in prison before leaving and actually reunited with her mum. Her mum. So she continued to work as a maid after she got out of prison and she now worked as a hotel maid. As far as we know, there were no murders committed at this hotel. And then she was reported to have died in 1982. But now this is where things get even more interesting, in my opinion. There's differing reports about her death and we don't really know why. A French filmmaker and producer claims that he actually found Leah in a hospice center using a fake name many, many years later. He claims that she had suffered from a stroke and was now in this hospice center until she would die. And he spent a short amount of time with her leading up to her death. He claims that she gave him details about her life, her upbringing and the murder and claims that, you know, she was Leah Paplin. And because they spent such a short period of time together after she died in 2001, we never will really know whether or not that was really one of the Pappen sisters or whether that was just a sick old lady who had some sort of interest in the sisters and might have known them even and thought that she was. And the reason I find this so interesting is because it reminds me of Anastasia. If anyone has ever seen that movie, the Dis oh no, it's not Disney, sorry, the Fox movie uh, about Princess Anastasia, the Russian princess. Same sort of deal happened. The princess was lost as a child. People thought she was murdered. People thought she had, you know, disappeared, but was still alive. People weren't sure. And then uh, a man found this older lady again in a hospital as she was dying, who again claimed that she was Princess Anastasia. And you know, half the world believes that that was really Princess Anastasia. Half the world believes she was killed or she had gone missing or whatever. And that was not her, that was just a sick old woman. But I just like the parallels between the stories because I love Anastasia. So I think that's really, really interesting. And I really, truly wonder whether that was Leah Paplin or not and we will never know. That is the story of the sister murder maids, the Pappin sisters. Thank you so much for watching. Make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you feel like it. I would really appreciate it and be sure to subscribe so that you can see all my new videos. I post every single Thursday all about true crime and every single Thursday of October is going to be a Halloween episode. This is only the first of four so subscribe so you can see all of them. 
Um, there's some cool stories coming up. I'm quite excited. And if you want to see the behind the scenes makeup and that, make sure you go and follow my social medias, especially my Instagram, which is all linked in the description, but I may possibly be making a second YouTube channel. I just don't know. It's very daunting to me. I'm throwing it. I don't know. I don't know. Let me know. Let me know. Also, let me know what you think about this story. What do you think about the Pappen sisters? What do you think about their parents, about their conviction, and about the murder? Because obviously the murder is horrific. Why do you think they did it? Why do you think they did it the way that they did it? Why do you think the eyeballs? Why so violent? What do you think fueled this? Whose fault is this? Should Leah have only gone to jail for eight years? Eight years? Whether or not she was manipulated? Eight years for gouging out someone's eye, like, woof. It's a lot. Let me know in the comments down below what you think because I would absolutely love to hear your opinion on this one. And also, happy fucking Halloween. If you have any Halloween costumes or Halloween makeup looks or anything Halloween, please send them to my social medias because I love them and I know this, this outro is getting way too long, but I want to see, I need some inspo. I have a Halloween party at the end of the month and I still don't know what I'm gonna wear, so I need all the help that I can get. Make sure you guys are being safe out there. Don't always do what your sister tells you to do. Watch out for hotel mates because they can be really shifty sometimes. And most importantly, have a happy, happy, hella fucking ween. Thank you guys so much for watching. Stay safe out there. Bye.